Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to have you here today uh, on this panel on European African Sustainability Partnership. Uh, I'm really happy to uh, welcome uh, um, uh, Professor uh, uh, Pandori and uh, Otto uh, Waterlander uh, from Belgium, both of them, you know, key expert on, on that matter. Uh, and uh, we, I'm very delighted to uh, moderate today's session. Um, uh, for all of you who are um, uh, the vice premier and minister from the Democratic Republic of Congo, she's still trying to dial in. She uh, is facing some significant communication problems at the moment. Uh, we are constantly on WhatsApp here in, in discussion how she can get into the system. So hopefully she will join us in the course of the session and we are eager to hear also her view um, since she is one of the major players in the sustainability field. Uh, she had a major stage uh, in Glasgow, negotiated a good deal there for the African nations and uh, is now in depth in the, develop, uh, in the preparation of um, COP27 in Cairo. So that's why, you know, we are eager to hear her view on uh, our today's topic. Um, let me start with the first round of a uh, question. Uh, this morning we had a fantastic uh, panel and um, in particular the African side said for the first time the continent is not only the little brother of the West providing some uh, raw materials, but for the first time we can go straight and uh, offer the West support and uh, come with a, uh, in a matter of strength because we have the green energy, we have the resources, and we can make it happen that decarbonization uh, can happen worldwide. So, um, Phoebe, what is your view? How do you see, uh, is Africa now the solution for the Western world? Uh, well, the... Um... I think it's important to understand what we already have on our table. And we have some blueprints that are relevant for the whole of the world. So we have the SDGs. And here I am uh, representing the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, which is a global network with hubs all over the world, uh, more than... Um, thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands of members with the mission to communicate to the stakeholders uh, that need to be engaged in this sustainability transition, the solutions for these transitions. And the solutions are, of course, technological, financial, and policy solutions. So we need to identify the optimal mixture of these solutions for each and every country. We have our policy framework, we have the SDGs, a very holistic and interrelated uh, policy framework. And to be honest, after UN uh, COP27, we uh, have 40 countries having, uh, uh, um, committing to um, climate neutrality by 2050. We have China committed to climate neutrality by 2060. We have India committed to climate neutrality by 2070. And we have the US and China uh, agreeing to continue climate negotiations. This is the snapshot of climate uh, pledges, pledges to climate neutrality, um, uh, the worldwide uh, photo of commitments. However, we need to be very, very, very careful. The only place of the world, in the world that actually has an implementation strategy that has policies and laws and legislations activated that can lead that uh, can lead the way to climate neutrality is Europe. We have the European Green Deal, the nine policies that compose the European Green Deal, and all the uh, climate-related regulations like climate law and the Fit for 55, all these legislative proposals for the uh, transition to climate neutrality that basically refine 
all the laws and regulations that have to do with energy, with uh, food systems, with uh, mobility systems, and so on. So it is very important to understand that uh, 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 unless these pledges are translated into laws and regulations and policies, and unless the financing of this transition is explicitly worked out, it is very difficult for the transition to take place. And the EU not only regulates at national level and not only uh, uh, creates laws and directives that are transposed into national law, they We've already also introduced the EU taxonomy and the corporate sustainability financing that helps the transition within the business and the financial institutions. So after COP27, we have 40, 450 business and financial institutions worth of 130 trillion vowed to put climate at the heart of finance. We also know that to avoid greenwashing, we need to provide the capacity to the businesses and financial institutions to engage in this transition. Thankfully, the technological advancements, the pace of innovation and technological advancements is such at this very critical point in time of our history that renewables are cheaper than fossil fuel, that circular technology provides solutions, that nature-based solutions are really part of the solution and they are cost effective. Climate adaptation projects are relevant. However, we really need a very firm sustainability directive like the one we've introduced in Europe in order to provide the guidance and capacity in the financial world and in the business world to really transform towards becoming green and digital and at the same time profitable. So we need a hybrid metric of the performance of each asset management company, of each business that really measures the profitability, the financial performance, but also the environmental performance and the social performance. And we need to find a way to transpose the social and environmental performance into um, monetary terms in order to integrate in the business model of a company and become a core in a, a core variable in the decision making of a company because we've shown and you can read the last report of the uh, senior working group of uh, uh, of the SDSN on the European Green Deal we've shown that uh, environmental performance is highly correlated with uh, financial performance and lately the companies that are transforming into becoming green are those that remain um, that are those that benefit the most from the refinement of the green and digital policies of the uh, European Green Deal and the recovery funds. So to cut a long uh, story short, it is quite important to have the regulations and policies and frameworks that will enable the transition. It is important to provide capacity to the businesses and financial institutions and all other involved stakeholders for engaging in the transition. Capacity means knowledge, technology, and finances. And of course, very importantly, developed countries need to really act on their commitment of a hundred billion goal a year for climate mitigation and adaptation. We've been promising that for many years, we've never delivered. And I would like to also say that it is quite important that we understand that the um, emerging markets and the uh, um, less uh, developed countries, low-income uh, countries, uh, do not have this fiscal space for the massive unprecedented transformation that is needed. So I would urge the G20 uh, to take major steps, uh, steps for development of financing a green and digital and inclusive recovery 
based on the SDGs agenda, increasing lending to the uh, to the developing uh, uh, increasing lending to the multilateral development banks to provide the less developed countries funding, increases support of UN member states for ingre- uh, for existing green funds and enacting global tax reforms on mega wealth and carbon emissions for climate financing. I'll leave it here. Thank you. Thank you, Phoebe, for your extended uh, answer. Let me turn to, to Otto. And uh, um, t- uh, Phoebe pointed out, you know, the legislation and you from a practical point of view as an entrepreneur, you know, heading up one of the largest developers now on green energy. Um, what is your recommendation to the politics? You know, what is required from your point of view, you know, to make it happen, Otto? Thank you very much. Um, and I think there's indeed a wonderful bridge. I think if I um, summarized in a very short way, I would say let the political environment and let the policymakers not get in the way of the companies now to act. Um, and I will come back to what I mean with that. I think today we have a situation where um, we were never more aligned and never in a better position to act between, in particular, European need and the African continent. And we are never more because we now have a real energy transition that has received its necessary urgency. In my experience over the last 30 years in the energy market, most matters are driven by urgency, not just by importance. We know that the energy transition is important, But now we have an urgency that is created uh, outside of our scopes by Russia. And that has created a dramatic need for Europe to uh, win away from the Russian dominance in terms of energy supplies. So we have a crisis and we should not let it loose. This is momentum that we can take and the businesses are prepared for it to invest in. Now, what do we need to do in order to actually move forward and actually make this promise a reality? We need to think about um, the significant scale of investments. Uh, Phoebe is completely right that innovation has moved so far that renewable energy now has become uh, lower cost than fossil sources. But there's a very important missing link in the industry today. Most of the energy transition focus and the um, Renewable investments have focused on the electricity system. And the electricity system in Europe is about 75 to 80 percent, sorry, 25 percent, 20 to 25 percent of the total energy system. The other 75 to 80 percent of the energy system have hardly received attention. We have some biofuels into the system, but for the rest, there's very little progress. There's an effort to increase the electrification, but the systems are dramatically falling short to actually make that the key to transform the molecule part of Europe. So we need a link between renewables that can be uh, available at electric form in Africa at very large scale, at very economic opportunity, and the molecule needs that Europe has. And the missing link is formed by hydrogen. And that is why the European Union is now applauding so much on hydrogen and putting so much of their efforts on the hydrogen. And when we look at that, hydrogen forms that unique link between the two and e-methane, so making methane out of um, uh, electricity that is produced very low cost, e-methane consumes CO2 at the start and therefore is a wonderful carrier to actually bring the gas to the European market in a completely net zero base. What do we need to do in order to uh, to, to achieve that? I would say the first we need to recognize is that such a chain needs long-term investments, significant investments. And that means that we need to move into contracts between buyers and sellers. And those contracts will last a long time. And that is actually a, not only a formal and a financial contract, that is an investment contract and therefore presents a true social contract. Some companies will still 
see the investments on the whole value chain to be risk between emerging and developed countries. That's where institutions can come and play, help us to take away any of those perceived risks. And then the investments can start playing. It is economic today if we don't um, think about small scale developments, but really large scale developments. Scale has helped us a lot and will help us a lot more. And here I come to the crux for uh, policymakers not to get in the way. We have a set of rules that need and that are being proposed, but we need implementation. I do not need another pledge of bigger plans. I need implementation. I need the CBAM that is proposed in Europe to be implemented. Even if it is not perfect at the start, it has to be implemented because it is the only way to ensure a level playing field at what inevitably Europe is going to be a higher cost environment. So it's important. It is also important to finalize the uh, emission trading scheme in such a way that if CO2 is used in a, um, in a, in a close loop to actually bring e-methane to from Africa to Europe, that it is recognized under the ETS system is a crucial factor to stimulate investments. And third, I would suggest that the origin of certificates for to enable the imports need to be put on paper. Words from Mr. Timmermans that are helpful and are important that Europe needs the imports is not good enough. I can make investments tomorrow if I know what the rule is. So please issue a draft fast. The final thing that where politicians should not get in the way is stop, please, with all this dramatic showering of the entire market in small scale subsidies. We've been marketing in particular in Germany for the last two years. And what we have found is that a lot of activities is now driven by subsidies. But most of those subsidies is yet for the next let's say, 20 megawatt electrolyzer for the next $10 million investment. That is not transformation. That doesn't change Europe. We need gigawatts, tens, hundreds of gigawatts on the investments. And what our analysis shows is if we scale up large scale, we do not need the subsidies. And therefore, my pledge is let's get away of the small scale and uh, subsidies that are in the way Let's think about executing now in big time. And then you will find, as you kindly uh, introduced us, to be at the leading edge to actually make that bridge also between Africa and Europe and hopefully between many other continents and Europe in that way as well to reduce the, um, uh, to reduce the dependency on only one place uh, in the world now. Thank you so much, uh, Otto, for your, uh, you know, interesting insight and recommendation. Uh, I saw Phoebe also looked very interested um, in this, and I think uh, uh, it is of most importance that the industry and the politics are working much more closer together, uh, you know, to make it really happen and to achieve the best goals. Uh, we have seen this now actually very positively. Uh, on the African continent, and uh, let my uh, let me um, you know give you some examples how we um, uh, work um, very positively at the moment with governments and industry together to make it happen. Yeah, and uh, let me uh, present what uh, I was hoping the minister would present today. We are working very closely these days uh, with governments in Congo, in uh, Zambia, in uh, Botswana together to really uh, take um, a stand and, and make transition happen. Yeah, And uh, part of it is, um, uh, and you might have seen this in the press, that uh, we formed a five-country a research center in the middle of Congo to develop the next generation batteries. Because Congo is the source of all the raw materials of advanced, modern, high-performance batteries, but so far only exported the raw materials. 
Yeah, so together with um, the Japanese uh, Institute for Advanced Science and Technology, with uh, Steinbach University, with University from Lolobashi, University from Zambia, uh, we formed now this really great uh, high-tech center in the middle of Africa, developing completely new batteries with much higher performance uh, in order to make a contribution not only for the continent, but also to reduce the amount of CO2 which you need today. I mean, you can imagine when you take raw materials from the middle of Africa, move them to China so that they get processed in China, and then these raw materials get returned, shipped to Europe to produce battery cells in order to sell, to ship them to the US to make actual batteries. Yeah. Today, what we gonna, um, what we are setting up is that all these raw materials actually get processed in Africa, cells get produced in Africa, and batteries get produced in Africa, and then can be shipped to Europe and the US as finished goods. Yeah, saving tons of CO2. And, um, and I must say, Phoebe, if, if the project is feasible, and there I must agree with uh, Otto, in the world this has been the sum of rule for the last 100 years. There's much more money than good projects. So feasible projects always get funding. Yeah, and we did, and, and in this respect, we didn't even had any issue, you know, based on 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 the feasibility, yeah, and working, you know, in partnership with the governments. The other thing, and and I must say, uh, Europe is sometimes very slow, yeah, and uh, me as a European, I always fight, you know, let's try it with the European Union, get some money there, let's get the projects organized, and I was actually proven wrong. Uh, most of the projects we are doing now on the continent are actually co-funded by the Middle East, you know, by Islamic Development Bank, by the different countries. There's a huge interest supporting the continent on this uh, transition. Yeah, and uh, I'm, I'm really honored and happy that uh, I will be able to fly with the Vice Premier from Congo on June 8th to Abu Dhabi to sign a partnership between UAE and Congo to save the rainforest in Congo. And Abu Dhabi is willing to offtake the carbon credits, yeah, which are generated according to Red Plus. Yeah. So that, for the first time, will enable Congo actually to invest significantly into its own economy, into sustainable industrialization. And part of it will be that Congo will use this hydro energy in order to work with Otto uh, to produce green hydrogen on a very large scale. You know, we are talking about 30 gigawatt. So, yes, uh, it happens when governments work together on a very practical way and when um, uh, entrepreneurs like Otto say, this is what we want to do. Yeah. So, uh, Phoebe, from your perspective, what can we do to motivate the European Union to get a step quicker on, on, on the industry? Well, the European Union is trying to do a lot on the industry, but let me clarify a few things. The problem with the energy transition is that many of the effects of energy use uh, and the way energy has been produced and is still being produced have public good characteristics. So because of that, because fossil fuel create climate change, because the use of nuclear power creates toxic waste that stays there for 70 years, and because this uh, climate crisis and the biodiversity collapse crisis and the pandemic health crisis are public crises, they have public good characteristics, this means that unfortunately or fortunately, you need the intervention of the taxpayer, of the governments, because there are aspects for which you do not you are not able to uh, assign explicit property rights. 
Okay, so even if an energy project is profitable, even if we know now that renewables are cheaper, even that Europe and the rest of the world is uh, betting on hydrogen and Europe has a growth strategy that explicitly says that it should let the foundations for a hydrogen economy that will start by 2030, there are many aspects in this transition of public good nature. Public good nature means that you pay for the investment, but the benefits go to everybody, not just to the investor. And it's these externalities, the positive externalities that the governments need to be there to subsidize. Because unless you subsidize them, the private sector will, will focus on the segments of these projects that are able to capture by private benefits. They cannot capture the public benefits. So unless you subsidize these, uh, um, uh, these uh, activities, unless you integrate the value of natural capital and social capital and the long-run value of um, technological advancement, because the technological advancement has a footprint on growth multipliers, a huge one, which becomes apparent not immediately, but after five or 10 or 30 years. The benefits of the energy transition that you see now when you say it's profitable to have this energy project are there and the uh, private sector is interested in, in going in and investing, but it does not calculate the very long run benefits. So it could be the case that in your cost benefit analysis and in your business model, you are ex excluding huge benefits that derive from hedging against the irreversibility that the current pathway is creating. So what is important to understand is that you need a very holistic approach. It's not only hydrogen, it's not only renewables, it's not only alternative fuels. You need to conceive the transformation on a systems approach. You need a mega transformation, huge projects, but you need to understand that you simultaneously address, you need to address multiple objectives and promote the right mixture of policy instruments and technological uh, solutions that can be used across the various sectors of the economy. And obviously, you have various pillars, zero carbon electricity, electrification of end users, green synthetic fuel, smart power greens, material efficiency, sustainable land use, immobility, and so on. But you need to be very careful about your analysis. First, you need to understand the systems approach and the complexity of that approach. You need to understand that this transformation has many private elements, but also many public elements. So you need public-private partnerships for that. Everybody knows that most money in the world is in private hands. So you need to mobilize those money, but you also need to be certain that a lot of the infrastructure needed needs to be at least managed by uh, the public sector. So the public-private par partnerships in many of these transformations are uh, a, a, a one-way um, pathway. And this is exactly what we will be doing in the newly launched Global Climate Hub of SDSN that will have its headquarters in Athens exactly because it works with the US, Europe, Africa, uh, Australia, Asia. We are going to construct explicit pathways for the transition that are systemic, are holistic, are, are, are focusing on the optimal mixture of uh, technological solutions, uh, policy instruments, and uh, financing, uh, trying to mobilize a lot of the private finance that is there, but without ignoring the need for public involvement. Thank you so much, Phoebe. Um, 
I'm looking a little bit at the clock. I have another 15 minutes, but I think uh, uh, I will put you two uh, in a separate group. I think we could discuss this for, for another 12 hours. Maybe Thomas. Uh, but um, uh, let me quickly comment on it. I, I see here huge gaps in, in terms of the perception uh, from the public sector and the private sector. And, and I think uh, I saw, you know, in Otto's eyes that he was shaking a little bit his head, and I, I, I must agree. And we see this also uh, on the continent where the public sector and private sector must work much closer together to fill these gaps of uh, understanding how we can do this decarbonization and the transition. Yeah, I think uh, uh, it is, um, you know, on a piece of paper, it looks very difficult. But uh, if we have pragmatic people sitting together, uh, we find solutions. And this is what we do every day at the moment with governments all over the continent. We find pragmatic, good solutions. Yeah, And this is what I actually like on the continent in, in Africa. And I think this is where we have to get back to in Europe. And I think through the new geopolitical situation and the additional pressure which came up, actually governments start to think practical again. When I look at our Mr. Habeck, you know, he thinks actually very practical. Uh, Otto, stage is yours. You, you wanted to comment it, on it maybe five minutes so I can ask the final questions after that. I will sure make sure that you have the last five minutes. Now, so I think um, Phoebe is totally right. This is about a systems approach into a probably one of the largest scale transformations that we've seen in our lives. Um, and for sure, it is the largest scale transformation that I will see in my life. So that, that is also for sure. Um, I think also we need to recognize that it's very hard to oversee the entire system. And we don't have time to analyze, analyze, analyze until everybody has figured out everything in the last detail. We need a lot of the initiatives and a lot of the activities in parallel. Electrification of cars is a great thing to do. Uh, putting in hydrogen into the more heavy duty fuel, great. Putting LNG into ships, no, don't wait to fit. Actually, let's move into the direct direction and then we'll pick up the next step, etc. So we need a lot of elements. But I think what is important is that what you unilaterally see across markets is that once economists can play, then the adoption rate comes dramatically different. And that is what we saw in both wind and solar. And I'm with Phoebe that you need to have a period where you subsidize because without subsidies in the initial period, the adoption of the wind and the solar would not have been here today and we would not have actually pushed this forward. So I'm completely on that. I fundamentally disagree with the idea that the policymakers need to subsidize it. Phoebe said, maybe you don't mean it exactly that way, unless we subsidize it, it's not going to work. And I fundamentally disagree with that. I think actually that um, I completely understand the common good. I've been talking for the last 20 years how the policymakers have to be the agent for all of us and put a price on CO2, manage the 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 space we have to live in and manage the, 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 the reduced amount of emission capacity we have. And that is happening. But please do it by putting a price on it, putting actually, you don't have to subsidize everything. If negative effects get a cost, then industry starts acting. We've never had a zero CO2 price in the world anywhere. Unless about 18 months ago, it started to play up. And this comes together with relative higher energy prices because we've now finally started to see that a gradual underinvestment in fossils is not playing well for fossils. And fossils are pricing themselves out of the market. And the last thing we need is subsidies to reduce that effect. We actually wanted this effect. But we, we are not, Otto, we are not using the subsidies to reduce those effects. We are using... Uh, I mean, emissions trading systems, ta taxes, and so that to reduce. What you need the subsidies for is for the benefits that are created that cannot be captured by the investor. Because when you reforest the ecosystem services that you support, 
are so pervasive, their value for human welfare is so huge that this particular action is worth much more than the the actual investment and the benefits that you get. So what I'm saying is subsidize the positive externalities so that they don't get lost from the picture. If you see the uh, uh, latest report that I shared there, you will see how, how huge the value of these positive externalities is and how important it is to reveal them on the table so that they uh, are promoted. Sorry for interrupting. No, no, it's a good interruption. And there will be areas where we need to do that. When I actually go back to the energy transition itself, um, me, my investors, our companies putting our own money on the table, not somebody else's money. So we, you can just be sure for one thing, we've done a lot of analysis in order to make sure that we understand what we do. What I'm telling you today, and maybe this is becoming new, like what we saw with uh, wind and, uh, and, and solar early on, what I'm saying today is that today the markets are in a place where scale will do a better job for the next step than further subsidies. And if we think about the vast potential that e-methane or green gas, as we call it, actually has, for the whole system, it is a dramatic improvement and the potential is super fast and can come much faster than we wish. And let me finish. We are not going to argue this here uh, all together. That was not the point. But let me finish with an invitation that I would love to spend time to help introduce what in our case at the moment the skill can do. And that skill will help to come back to the theme of today can help the collaboration between Africa and uh, Europe on a dramatic large uh, step and actually bring this much faster close together, which allows us to benefit from the momentum that we have out of this set work. Very good. Let me just say that I agree with scale. Let me just say that I agree with scale that the subsidies are for the positive, huge positive externalities that are hidden. It is important that they are monetized and they are promoted. The energy sector does not have huge need of, uh, of these positive subsidies, but the sector on water, food, energy nexus, on which we work a lot and is prevailing in, in Africa, and uh, other sectors like the marine sectors, they need to uh, put on the table the value of ecosystem services and, uh, and subsidize those. And, and let me close by saying that it is hugely appreciated that uh, the, the, word, the, uh, the work that your company and other companies are doing, it is uh, critical and important that you are now engaged, but there is also a part of projects that are not scalable, that are needed. So that's one thing to note and also care for those sectors. And there is also part of the uh, people that are uh, vulnerable and they will face the regressive effects from climate policies and those should be uh, also supported. So I'll stop talking about Thank you so much, Phoebe, and uh, I think um, you are absolutely right, and uh, this is certainly what we also see every day, uh, the, the actual consequences of climate change. Yeah, I mean, uh, I just have to look outside at the moment. We have a major uh, <laughs> thunderstorm here with hail and everything, so I'm glad you still can hear me here. Um, However, I want to conclude, uh, and, and we have another five minutes, and, and maybe coming back to my initial statement and uh, maybe, you know, two-minute statement from you too. I still believe, and, and I'm still a, a strong believer in this, that uh, this transition is a major opportunity to form a strong partnership between Europe and Africa. Yeah, Nowhere in the world we have so much green energy, so many resources, and the African continent for the first time really has the opportunity uh, to be uh, a partner for Europe uh, on the same level. 
Yeah, uh, and like um, you know, the speaker this morning said, we are not only we are not anymore the little brother. So uh, maybe Phoebe, you start first, and then uh, Otto. You know, how is your view on how Europe and Africa can make a win-win situation? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for the development of the African continent, but also to enhance our transition to a better future and green energy. Yeah, very quickly. And unfortunately, I have to leave because I have a keynote speech that are waiting for me. But let me say that this was a, a lovely conversation. Uh, and uh, let me say that uh, Europe has to invest in Africa. Europe knows that it has to invest in Africa. It created a priority uh, for Africa in its uh, research and innovation uh, DG and uh, work uh, intensively on Africa project. What is important that we understand is that Africa is a wealth of opportunities. Africa uh, is um, a, a big uh, market, a very vulnerable to climate change uh, market. So for me, it is crucial that Europe figures out the way to engage in each and every country in Africa in big transformation projects, which will be co-designed by the local communities, by the local entrepreneurs, by the local governments, by the local uh, technological innovation systems, and so on, and actually bring in the uh, innovative capacity of Europe uh, that is uh, increasing and is being, um, uh, you know, becoming more prevalent the last five years. Bring all that capacity to Africa and, inc and increase the possible clients. So Europe has a lot to benefit from Africa because it, Africa is a big market. It's a market which uh, can absorb. Uh, the some of the innovation capacity of uh, Europe and also, although it is not directly transposed what we are doing in Europe, it is a leadership example that uh, it can be partly adjusted uh, to the African case study, which will enable uh, businesses, uh, business collaborations, uh, technological development collaborations and uh, policy collaborations. I stop here. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm really happy that uh, Professor Masala from the uh, uh, Vice Prime Minister is uh, here, uh, now finally managed to, to get in. Uh, um, maybe a quick greeting, Professor Masala, before uh, Otto then is closing the session. Oh, th thank you very much, uh, Frank, and uh, hi, a big hi to everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Uh, okay, uh, we're very sorry about uh, this network issue. Uh, we are actually connecting from the U.S., not from home. Uh, so I've been able to follow only the last uh, 10 minutes of the meeting, and I really, really appreciate and, uh, and uh, support uh, almost all the things that have been mentioned here concerning the, um, the future uh, collaboration between Europe and Africa under climate change uh, mutual obligations. So uh, to not take your time because I jo we join only at the end of the session, I prefer sending you the observations that would have been the speech uh, or the interventions of the Vice Prime Minister Iba Zaiba. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Otto, stage is yours. So, you know, I am a glass half full person. I believe that this is an absolute fascinating opportunity for a win-win uh, setup between Africa and Europe. I think the time is now. I think that uh, if you look across the world, the, the relationship between GDP or development of countries and energy availability is dramatic. It's very clear. We never before had the opportunity to link those two continents through energy the way we can actually do it now. So I would say if we work now together fast, then the energy availability for the local countries, for the communities, together with an expert potential that generates only additional income, will be one of the key developers um, that 
I think it's our opportunity. There's one worry I have in my life, and that's around food. And I do believe that if we are actually creating the right outcome on the energy side, then we probably have laid a, a big part of the basis for the food side as well. So I'm very optimistic about this, and I really look forward to uh, uh, my further interactions uh, to build those ties between Africa and Europe. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for this great session. And I uh, hope to see you soon again. Again, thank you, thank you also to you, Otto. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.